what are we presenting here today is uh, a highly collaborative effort. So I have listed some names uh, with the correct spelling now. Uh, uh, some names of the, the folks that are uh, closely involved, but, but then there's, there's many more and, and also there's support from, from the other uh, LCF. So, um, and also these names are in alphabetical order because it's really hard to give, to figure out, you know, who, who, how should we rank them? It's, it's really a collaborative effort amongst equals. Um, all right, so I'll be talking about uh, our efforts in uh, deploying a real-time data analysis workflow uh, called Exafel um, on ECP, so Exascale Computing Project hardware. Um, and so um, I think la uh, at the beginning of this conference, we already heard about the fact that EC uh, the HPC is evolving. And a lot of people kind of think of it like this. You know, you've got some compute, and then you've got more compute. Um, and and that's, not, that's not really true. Um, it's actually more evolving like this. First of all, you all probably already, if you've got data-intensive computing, know that the compute and storage sometimes don't work well together. Uh, and so, so we have, we have a, a list of, of pieces, and that list of pieces is really getting just, there's going to be more of everything, but also more kinds of pieces. Um, and this, this is only a subset. I'm sure if you have your favorite technology, you can probably chuck it out here and it, it will have a future in HPC. And so it's really helpful to think about uh, when, when you think sort of as a strategic application readiness uh, perspective, to really say that we're going from applications to workflows. And so um, part of that is uh, what Debbie already mentioned and, and the DOE's effort to, to go towards a broader integrated research infrastructure ecosystem. Um, and so um, Debbie mentioned the super facility report. Uh, so you can, you can get that here. And so for, for uh, um, XFEL, so free electron laser data analysis, what super facility uh, and, and IRI really means is bringing uh, the HPC and the experimental equipment closer together lowering barriers to entry. And this is really important because we expect that the data rates from, from X-Files is going to increase by somewhere around 400 times. And, and so uh, the data rates are going to outpace the locally available resources. And so for that, we've, we've really, um, at NERSC, uh, have been developing the super facility model. <clears throat> you can read more about that in this report. Um, but uh, just uh, more broadly, it's not just uh, XFELs. We have many other workflows at NERSC that really have a similar um, problem or, or similar challenges. And, and they span a lot of areas as well. Um, and so I like to kind of think of it in, in sort of a cartoon diagram, right? So our traditional HPC, and I use traditional in quotation marks, uh, so obviously um, there are um, Non-traditional applications live in here as well, but HPC that, that is sort of very uh, Q-bound, so not, um, it doesn't really matter so much other than impatience, whether the job starts you know, today or tomorrow. And, and the jobs are submitted as scripts, and once they're submitted, they're static things, and they just sort of wait in the queue and, and never change until they run. And so if we kind of look at, at the workflows that are running at NERSC, um, you can kind of create a cartoon like this. So you've obviously got VASP, LAMPS, hydrodynamics, all of those kinds of codes living squarely in this traditional HPC corner. So we can't forget about it. We really still have to focus on that. But then we have all of these other workflows that, that live in these extra quadrants uh, where you might have a script, but it has to happen right now when an event happens at an experiment. Or you might uh, not have uh, a script and you just want to mess with the data and, and maybe I'll submit I start my Jupiter, my multi-node Jupiter job. It might take an hour to start, but you know that's okay. I'll get a coffee. And then there's the really hard bit, which is you don't know what kind of script you're gonna run, but you have to run it right now. When when it has to run. <laughs> and and Xfile really falls right up here. So CCTBX is one of the software uh, that I will be talking about. And so. In this talk, I I'm going to uh, really break that up into to two main pieces. First, I want to look at the human perspective. So really the XFEL plus super facility and how, how this is used. And then later, 
um, I want to talk about the engineering nuts and bolts and, and really how, how it was implemented. And then finally, we're going to look at some lessons learned. So first, the human perspective. So um, a serial crystallography um, experimental hutch will look something like this. I think this is a picture from Slack. Um, and you can see it's, it's a very crowded environment. Lots of people are actively making changes to an experiment. And what's really, if I, if I boil this down to a cartoon, this is really what's happening. You have a stream of uh, crystals that, that, that have an unknown molecular structure. Uh, and, and that is being delivered to an, uh, the experiment at high rate. And then you have pulses of X-ray light that are really pulsing at high rate as well. And then they're going to meet here. And so then, uh, you know, they, essentially they have a brilliance of something like a million suns. So a really a high intensity interaction happens at this point. It destroys the sample. So there's no do, do over here. But just before that happens, uh, it will create a spot pattern on this uh, X-ray detector. And from that spot pattern, you can then reconstruct the molecular structures and also the chemical interactions if you've collected enough of those spot patterns. And so it's a little bit like this. You've got, you've got a, 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 a spot patterns coming in and every now and then. You can see that each picture looks very different, by the way. But every now and then you see sort of a flash of some, some dots here. And so the challenge for, for exascale is you have many of these spot patterns. And it's a little bit like, let's say you've got Google Street View, but you're not given the images in sequence. You're just given all the Google Street View images in the world. And your challenge is make a map of them. And so that's really what, what uh, the, the, uh, the, the computing pipeline does. It, it takes all of these images, it creates a map of the spots, and then from that map, uh, you can uh, reconstruct the, the molecule that you have just measured uh, in, your, in your experiment. But it's, um, it's not that easy. So first of all, beam time is super scarce, right? Uh, you know, it's an oversubscribed resource like a supercomputer. And so when you go to a beam time and you want to um, measure as many samples as you possibly can, you don't want to find out later that you could have stopped measuring you know, sample A and you ran out of time with sample B. So ideally what you want is you want live feedback that tells you you've done enough measurements, you can move on to your next sample or, you can, or maybe there's a problem with the experiment. Whatever you're seeing makes no sense. You have to tweak and go in there and adjust the experiment. And unfortunately for this kind of algorithm, um, this requires a near complete reconstruction of the molecular sample uh, of the structure. Uh, and so you have to actually use HPC at this point uh, to, to be able to analyze all your data within a few minutes. Um, and so that is really the, the job of this uh, super facility pipeline. By the way, the IRI cover, uh, that's this image, which is from an uh, LCLS uh, um, experiment. So, um, so this is an art, artist re rendering. So the X-ray beam comes in here. Then data is read of this detector, and it's it's really coming into NERSC, and and we are, have incoming data. We're building jobs out of that incoming data, and we're monitoring the data analysis all within a few minutes. And so I'm going to show you a uh, a, a, a video, and I'm going to narrate this demo of the CCTBX. Uh, user interface. So uh, first we want to go and actually like run. So we're logged in at NERSC here. So now we are, oops, sorry. Uh, the video controls are kind of terrible. So we're logging into NERSC and uh, it starts this GUI. One moment, here we go. The GUI gets started. You enter parameters of what database to use. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look for new data coming in. There's some new data. So it talks to LCLS and it's found the following experimental runs. And we know, for example, that that run there is bad, so we can label it as bad. Or maybe we, we don't want to label it as bad. Uh, and so, so once we've got our data, we can set up trials, which are uh, parameter sets for the data analysis. So you can adjust your spot finder and, and other parameters, and you can select really how you want to analyze this data and once you've inputted all, all the parameters, you, you can say, well, I'm going to submit some new jobs. So right now there's no jobs in the queue. 
So what we want to do is auto-submit jobs, and the GUI automatically figures out which jobs need to be run to match the parameters to the data that's available, and it looks at data that's already been analyzed. So you, can, you saw here the jobs were submitted automatically, and now we can monitor the jobs, and they're, they're being run right now, and you can see indexing rates, uh, spot finding rates, that sort of thing, that you need to know whether you've set the parameters correctly. And you can, uh, you can sort of explore this data as it's being analyzed. And finally, you can give, get statistics about your run to see, you know, are the crystals what you think you are, that sort of thing. All right, so, um, so this is very much a custom workflow. Uh, that, that meets the needs of the uh, crystallography community. Uh, but the point here was we had an interactive workflow that automatically marshals all the jobs uh, that, that run on, on the supercomputer and gives back useful information in real time. Um, oops, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to, here we go. And so, so let's, uh, so, so here's a, a actual scientific use case that, that we worked uh, at NERSC together with the, folk, the other folks at LBL and the folks at uh, um, LCLS. And this is an example um, uh, of, of a, a substance, um, so mithrin derivatives essentially, and, and you can see that these, these, the, the ingredients are very similar, but this one uh, has no color and these ones are uh, photoactive. And the question was, how, how do we know? So, uh, no, we know that they're not photoactive, but why are they not photoactive, right? How do we analyze these samples? And so, the, um, so, so we, we use this tool. <laughs> I like showing this picture. We, we use CCTBX running at, at, at NERSC. We were collecting data in real time at, at, um, at Slack, uh, at LCLS. And within two days of, of uh, analyzing all the data, uh, so we were all on Zoom here, and, and this is the, the first time this, this sample was reconstructed. So the, the molecular structure of the sample was reconstructed. This is the first time this, anyone has actually seen this molecular structure, um, and it was within about 20 to 30 minutes of having actually collected this data. And, and that was really cool. And you, here you see the PI, he's got his bottle of whiskey out to, to celebrate. Um, and so what, what, what did they find? They've, they've published their results here. I can't, can't really do it justice more than a, a simple uh, layman's perspective, but uh, so if you lo look it up, uh, you can in the Nature article you can see exactly what they found. But basically, all of these derivatives they have they have a molecular structure where there's this uh, um, sheet of of um, uh, silver plus something, and then uh, that is suspended. So there there's some uh, organic groups hanging off it, uh, and so this sort of expand uh, um, suspended in solution like so. And then when we look at the sheet from the top, we see this um, network of uh, silvers and, and, and you know, whatever uh, dopant you've put in, whatever other uh, compound you've put in. And you can see that for thyrene, uh, we only have silver-silver bonds in, in, in one dimension. In the other dimension, it's been broken. Whereas for mithrene and tethrene, uh, this network spans 2D. So this network has, has got a much uh, lower... Uh, um, you need much fewer photon and energies of your photons to actually excite a response, whereas this one you've confined in one di dimension. That's sort of my very non-chemist uh, uh, perspective. Uh, but so this this was supposed to uh, show you the um, power of having real-time analysis. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> How do you validate that this re reconstructed molecule is accurate? That's a really good question. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I don't know how reconstruction algorithms work, so that's right. what I'm asking. Right. Um, they are uh, basically a, a self consistency solution. So um, if, if I just jump back to uh, these pictures, I don't know if you see it here, but you've got all of these black spots, right? Mm -hmm. So once you have a, a structure, you can say, what are the black spots? So, so once you have a model of your, your, your molecular structure, you can then do ray tracing to compute the Bragg spots and see how well they agree with, with what you've measured. And that gives you a score. And in the field, maybe Amadeo knows this better, but in the field there's some, some threshold. If, if you get a certain kind of score, it's considered good enough. So basically it's a structure refinement, right, yeah. on the fly? Yeah. 
Um, I'm just going to go back. In the same direction. Sure. Why was this real time? Was there any back coupling from the simulation back into the experiment? Yes. Um, this, maybe you can see, this is sort of a dirty sample. Uh, there was actually problems stabilizing these solutions. And on the first day, well, the very first day, we, we, we had problems with the beam. On the second day, so that you can identify at the experiment, right? Uh, you know, there's no beam coming out. You can see that immediately. But then uh, on the second day, we were seeing contaminants and problems with the crystals. Uh, from, and, and you can only see those. These, these kinds of contaminants, you still see spots on the detector. So just seeing spots doesn't tell you your sample's good. What you need to do is you need to like, use CCTBX to see what samples you can index. And they, what they had is spots. They had lots of spots. But they didn't meet that indexing threshold. They could not index it to a quality that was necessary to reconstruct the sample. And they actually had to go back and, and change the stuff here. right? And, and you really don't want to, to, to have flown out to, to a Slack and then be told none of your data is any good. And so, so that's why that real-time data analysis was necessary. And also, this was a, an algorithm. This was small molecule analysis. So computationally, it was actually more intensive than, than uh, protein crystallography. So that was something that wouldn't have been uh, possible at, at LCLS at the time with the resources that they've had. All right. Um, OK, so um, the... The next part of, of the human perspective is sort of from the center. So this was the perspective from, perspective from the experimentalists. So now, now let's put ourselves in the, in the shoes of data center operators and ask ourselves, how is the super facility paradigm actually used from our perspective? And so um, in particular, when we talk about interactive compute, I mean, you saw this, this cartoon I had before. There are many different ways people interact, right? So, so we want to... Uh, uh, get an idea, we can't really define interactive because it's so broad, but we want to get an idea of the different use cases in HPC. And so we're using XFL, uh, XFL to, as a uh, case study for interactive HPC workflows. And in order to do this, what we did is we deployed um, code uh, log mining, uh, sorry, this should be log, uh, yeah, log mining uh, code as well as automatic instrumentation of the actual workflows themselves to see what files are the, the analysis programs actually touching um, and, and uh, in those files, what data are they reading. And so very uh, uh, broadly, the workflow that you showed in the video, uh, it's a circular diagram because these things always have to be circles these days, but um, you have data acquisition at, at Slack and, and an automatic data transfer happening to on-site storage. Then you have to have a very responsive queue to submit jobs, and, and those jobs give real-time feedback, and the, the experimental users generate fresh tasks because uh, you, know, you might need to tweak the spot finder. Uh, you might speak, uh, need to adjust uh, the space groups that, that you think the crystals have, that sort of thing. And the experimental users will also make physical adjustments to the experiment. And so the questions that, that we were asking is, how is data getting to NERSC? How do the users interact with the workflow? And how responsive is the, is the can we make the job queue? So first question is, how does the data get into NERSC? Um, so this is a, um, a snapshot of our uh, monitoring tool <clears throat> that monitors the, the shared, uh, um, uh, the, 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 it manages the scratch, the, the, the monitors the part of the scratch file system where all the data that, that um, the LCLS data mover uh, moves data to, <clears throat> and you can see there's these really sharp spikes where in, so, uh, in some cases you've got two gigabytes a second and then nothing. So here, for example, there's some problem and so nothing is being measured. And then we've got these, these rapid spikes of, of bursts of data. And each one of these bursts here is a uh, individual run at, at LCLS. And we can actually look at the statistics of these things. And there's several things I want you to notice here. The first thing is the vast majority of files is getting to NERSC very, very quickly. But then you have this very broad tail. And, and these, these broad tails, they can, can really hold up a data analysis. So uh, it's, it's not just uh, good enough to know the average transfer rate. You want to know the tail transfer rate. Because uh, in these cases, there might be a problem with the file system. 
uh, the, I don't know how, how much you know about Luster, but there are intricacies about how Luster works uh, that can result in some files just being delayed as written to disk. By the way, this is the disk to disk transfer rate. This is what we really actually care about. This is not the network. We are spoiled in the sense that we have ESnet, which has a wonderfully fast network. Um, and actually, the, the disk tends to be the biggest uh, bottleneck here. And the other thing is the choice of file system matters. So this was when Perlmutter was still being stood up. And when we were sending data to Perlmutter, there's this little peak here. So there's actually um, an average, a slower average transfer rate to Perlmutter. So we are working on that, uh, and, and so we, we are aware of this, but um, that, that's something to also keep an eye out um, on. Um, and so... Uh, Question? Sure. Your file transfer time? Yes. Does not depend on the individual file size? Obviously, a bigger file will get there faster, but these files are all roughly the same size. Uh, there, there might be a, at most a 2x difference, uh, but, but they're all at least 20, 30 gigabytes. Uh, sometimes, depending on the, the chunking algorithm, it's like 50, 60 gigabytes for, 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 this, uh, for, for these experiments that we're studying. Um, and so then we were asking ourselves, well, how are jobs actually being submitted? How is the queue really being used? And so um, this, uh, th these are basically plots of um, the, the number of CPUs in use by LCLS at, as a function of time. And, and this plot here is really just this one, but zoom, oops, sorry, it's this one here, but zoomed in. So, so on the x-axis here, uh, you can see uh, we are, it's up to 80 hours. So, so this is for one beam time, right? So a beam time can be multi-day events, um, and, and often they, they have uh, like 12 hours uh, beam time, and then you can sleep, and then 12-hour beam time. So that's really what happens here. So the, these blocks here are just uh, experimentalists are humans, and they need to go to bed at some point. Um, so if we just look at one day of beam time, we can see this kind of be, uh, pattern. And what you see is um, very bursty uh, compute, and then these, these periods where nothing happens. And this is sort of uh, due to the natural cadence of these experiments. In the experiment, what you do is you, you measure, you adjust the experiment, you measure, you adjust the experiment. And, um, and this, this, is, uh, this cadence here, ideally, will uh, interleave with the um, data transfer, compute, and data interpretation. In this example, we, I, I, I've been very generous and let it overlap with the next measurement. So that does happen very, very frequently in the experiments that we've worked together with. But you can get uh, really good, like when everything works just smoothly, you can have data analysis within 10 minutes. So, so then this bar here will fit right into the, adjust, uh, into the adjustment period. So the point, though, is you have very bursty and often unpredictable bursts in compute. You, you can predict the day, but you can't predict what happens what hap uh, on the day. Uh, and so uh, a, an important sub-conclusion here is really the HPC Center wants to bridge uh, three time scales. So we have uh, the, the experiment and the job scheduler thinking in hours, essentially. Uh, humans think in, in minutes, and milliseconds is what the compute nodes think as. And so that's really helpful to keep in mind when designing these workflows. Um, and so uh, the next question that sort of derives from this is how much of the workflow actually requires this constant human interaction, right? Which part of the workflow is a script that just runs and looks for new data, and which part of the workflow requires a human to look at a plot and make an adjustment and see the next uh, and, and make, the, uh, make decisions. And so here is um, one of the results of code instrumentation. Uh, what we, we are doing here is we are plotting, as a, now in, in minutes, the difference between when a job has, so when an image, so one of these spot patterns was analyzed, um, and, we are sub, uh, and, and we, we're taking the time difference to when that image was measured. So, so this might be one uh, set of jobs, um, but, but that job will have analyzed a set of images and then maybe reanalyzed a bunch of images and then 
reanalyze that reanalysis. And so that's what these colors mean. So the blue is all the images that were analyzed only once. And then uh, the, the orange is jobs that have been analyzed once or more. And then uh, um, green is twice or more, magenta is three times or more, and so on. And so what you can see here is that, first of all, this is really cool. Some of these data analyses happen within a few minutes. But that's the, the tail end of one analysis run, sorry, uh, of one measurement run, uh, resulting in immediate data transfer and then immediate analysis at NERSC. So the, the majority of, of images were analyzed in, in the first 20 minutes. And, and then you can see that every, what is it, maybe 20 minutes or so, we are reanalyzing things. And so that's sort of an, in a fingerprint of interactivity. And in fact, we can uh, visualize it maybe like this. This is for um, a particular set of images. Um, we are, we're counting now how many times it's been uh, reanalyzed. This is automatic uh, units, I'm sorry. These are all integers. So processing uh, zero, one, so reprocessing once, twice, three times, and so on. And what you can see here is that uh, there's several reprocessings. And then there's nothing because the, the experiment uh, moves on. But then maybe new calibration constants are found. Another set of calibration constants are found. And so if we zoom into this plot here, you can see that the, the rep rate for these high frequency engagements for this experiment here was about 5.6 minutes. And, uh, and for this other experiment, we are seeing about 24 minutes. Uh, so that means that uh, experimentalists are looking at the data. And in this example here, they're they are thinking about it for 24 minutes, trying something else, looking at it, thinking about it for 24 minutes, trying something else. So, so this is what, what, what I would call really interactive. And, and of course, this peak here is urgent. And so every exp oh, yeah. Just give us a feeling like how processing intensive are these image steps? So are these like 10 nodes or 20 nodes? Oh, sure. Um, so for, for these guys here, we uh, are using 64 nodes. And, and, and these, um, so we have actually already run GPU jobs, but these analyses are actually on CPU nodes. So, uh, and, and I'm actually going to look at the, the architecture, so I will actually get back to you about uh, some more details. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, Something to keep in mind is that every experiment is different, right? So the experiment from these bottles that you saw early on is this LV95 here. So this was a small molecule data analysis job. And you can see that um, on the x-axis here, we have the number of images in total that were processed. So that an image that was reprocessed three times, for example, would be counted three times in this, data, in this bar graph. Um, <clears throat> And so you can see the, the majority of images were only looked at once and probably just ignored. And then a couple were analyzed several times. And then there's this little cluster of, of valuable images here that were, that were really interactively uh, dealt with. And then compare that to, for example, LY99, where you really just, uh, it's, it's more like an automatic pipeline. Or this experiment down here, which was a biological uh, uh, data of COVID proteins, and that uh, collected, uh, analyzed just a, a stupendous number of images, but you know most of them once again only looked at were looked at once. Um, so, so the the important takeaway here is that many images were really process, only processed uh, interactively. So, uh, only only five percent of images were really processed uh, really interactively. <clears throat> then the other question is. Um, uh, what's sort of the cadence of these? And, and once again, you can look at a, a histogram of the reprocessing times um, and as, as a function of experiment. And, and maybe you can even average over experiments, and then you can get this plot here. And you can see that if you, if you really average over everything, um, most images that do get reprocessed, those images have maybe a rep rate of somewhere around uh, 25 or, or 50 minutes. Mm, and then and, uh, going back to, to the job queue, um, if you remember, we have very bursty compute here. And this compute has to happen very uh, um, 
rapidly, right? We, we have to have a very highly responsive queue. Um, and so the way we do that is we, we use reservations of somewhere between 60 and 80 nodes, <clears throat> but those can be super wasteful, right? If, if, you, if you imagine, okay, let's say you already knew that this was the highest uh, number of nodes you'll need, um, and then all this, this area uh, between the upper line and this curve, that would be wasted compute, right? That would be compute that gets never used by, by this reservation. So we're trying to minimize the number of uh, idle uh, nodes in a reservation by uh, using, uh, but we were trying out for the first time with, with these experiments, the uh, preemptible uh, queues. So the way, how does a preemptible queue work? Well, it's um, when you set up your, sorry, not preemptible queue, preemptible reservation. So a pre, the way a preemptible reservation works is you, you request the reservation with a max start delay variable set. So for example, we can say uh, five minutes as this would be our request. We want our jobs uh, to allow other jobs into the reservation, but when we need to go, we need to have no less than, no more than five minute delay. That, that's at least the contract as we understood it at the time. Uh, and so then uh, if someone wants to use my reservation, what they do is they will add the signal uh, R int uh, whatever, some number, for example, 300. And so that would say that um, after three, like when, when your job is being asked to politely leave that reservation because something urgent has come, on, uh, 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 come in, uh, your job is said SIGINT. And it now has th 300 seconds to leave before Slurm kills it. Um, did that really happen? That was the question that we wanted to know. And so, what we did here is we analyzed, uh, um, so this was a low stakes beam, beam time, it was still important for the beam time, but we knew that we were okay with delays. So um, blue here are the urgent jobs from, the, um, from LCLS, and orange are preemptible jobs that are in the same reservation. Uh, down here we can show the, um, uh, the, in green, the number of real-time jobs that are waiting in the queue, and in orange, just orange again, just the number of preemptible jobs in the same um, reservation. All right. Remember, the question was, if, 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 if we say max start delay equals five minutes, then does Slurm take five minutes to, to quit, the, to, to make room for our jobs? And that seems to be roughly what happens we submitted the first couple of jobs, and then five minutes later, our jobs were being uh, admitted to the admittedly very full reservation at the time. Unfortunately, though, what happens is that's just the, that, that, that five minutes isn't really what we thought it would mean. That five minutes is Slurm going, oh, okay, I got to make some room. And then it still takes some more minutes to, to, to cancel the next one and the next couple of jobs, right? So you, you end up waiting much longer than five minutes before your jobs actually go, start in earnest. So in that sense, there was very much a misunderstanding about the internal mechanisms of Slurm uh, and, and what the variable max start delay really means. Uh, and, and here's the same experiment again, but with, this time with max start delay set to one minute. <clears throat> so the point is a, a five minute max start delay seems to have resulted in a 15 minute delay for, for processing, which is unacceptable. And a one minute max start delay still resulted in a nine minute delay uh, in processing. So we are, and, and you can see this plot here in blue, uh, we see the, the wait time for our real time jobs and in orange the, the number of nodes used by preemptible jobs. And you can really see that our, our wait time really jumped up uh, and then we lowered it to, to um, uh, uh, one minute and it, it got a bit better and in some cases you know you got maybe uh, four minutes but it still wasn't good. So we're working with uh, SCADMD to, to understand this problem a bit better before rolling this out in production. All right, so just a quick uh, intermission. Um, what, what are lessons learned from this human element? The first thing is we want to monitor really everything because you'll never know what data you need after the fact. Um, you want to make sure that your monitoring pipelines also give you real-time feedbacks about any problems like with the file system um, 
uh, that, that you need to act uh, on immediately. What we found is it usually takes about two minutes to transfer somewhere between uh, 20 to 100 gigabyte uh, uh, runs. Uh, and, and reservations are a great way to keep um, uh, our queue responsive, but preemption at the moment is still a work in progress. Uh, about 5% of, of all of our data required uh, um, high touch uh, interactivity. <clears throat> all right, so moving on to the engineering nuts and bolts. Um, first of all, this is still a human problem, right? Uh, just want as a quick reminder, so this is, these are nurse staff uh, in parallel assembling Perlmutter, and you can see there's lots of humans here Back here is a computer, but there's still lots of humans. So uh, even though we, we like to distinguish uh, the, the human aspects and the engineering aspects from our workflow, even engineering is a human endeavor. So how is CCTBX actually deployed uh, at, at NERSC? So CCTBX is the analysis, uh, one of the analysis program in the XFL project. That's the program we use. So um, first we have an automatic data mover uh, that uh, Slack has stood up that will automatically move data from their storage. Uh, this is an outdated diagram. It's actually now flash disk on both ends here. Um, then we have a, um, a job sentinel program that's part of the CCTBX uh, workflow uh, that regularly queries the LCLS REST API to check for new experiments. <clears throat> it also queries the database to see what experiments have already been analyzed and with what parameters. It uses that data then to submit new jobs to the job queue whenever it finds a, a gap between the needs to be analyzed and already has been analyzed list. And finally, the jobs are running in Shifter and Podman containers, so Shift on Cori, uh, Podman on Perlmutter. Um, uh, so the jobs are running in, in these containers, and as they are running, they are communicating with a SQL database that's hosted on SPIN um, to regularly update its, their progress and, and, and get more tasks. And in the meantime, they're drawing in data from the uh, Scratch file system. Um, and then uh, anywhere on Earth, uh, users can connect to this database with this uh, workflow uh, user interface and interact with the workflow the way that you've just seen uh, Aaron do in the video. All right, so how is the data getting to NERSC? Um, so uh, at, at Slack uh, um, and at NERSC, we are running a XRootD instance. And the idea is that uh, XRootD at Slack is in communication with their messaging uh, uh, service. And whenever a new experiment, is, uh, an experimental run is done, XRootD at Slack will initiate a communication with a, uh, one, one of the XRD clusters at NERSC. Once it uh, is set up, it um, transfers the data, and this can happen in parallel. So there, there's, uh, I think, uh, about 16 XRD workers on both ends uh, transferring data in parallel. The workflow is coordinated using a, uh, a database, a MySQL database hosted on SPIN, because there was some discussion about uh, how much traffic a database uh, can handle. I've decided to add, continue, include the slide here, and these are measurements from uh, the um, uh, from from our one of our most active experiments. Um, and the the sp the database on Spin was able to accommodate so roughly uh, roughly around se seven thousand database transactions per second. Uh, so we are using. Um, uh, uh, attempts to keep the number of connections low. So each rank only opens one connection and then reuses that connection for every image it processes. Uh, and, but on that connection, uh, we, we will have, uh, across all ranks at once, about 7,000 transactions. Um, we did notice that once we are pushing past um, about 80 nodes, things started to slow down here. So then uh, we implemented also uh, um, transaction pooling. Also, the, the data analysis workers themselves, they are um, MPI programs. Um, they usually uh, use up to 1,000 ranks. Um, and the way that they are uh, architected is you use PSANA on rank zero to distribute jobs over the worker ranks. And then each worker, once it's received the uh, ID and offset of each file, will access the, the, 
the, the raw data files independently on the Luster file system, it then processes this data uh, and writes intermediate results to uh, also the Luster file systems and it updates that database. And there's, there's roughly, I mean, if you uh, squint a wee bit, you can say that roughly ideal weak scaling uh, going up to a thousand ranks. Um, there's a lot of spread here and that's not because of the computer, it's because each image is different. So some images might require a lot of work and other images don't. And that's also why we're using a producer-consumer model because we don't know ahead of time how much each image, how much work each image will be. All right, so this uh, uh, project is uh, funded by, uh, thanks, by ECP. So our uh, objective here uh, is also to to do performance optimization and really push this project into exascale territory. And so the first thing that we do is, is really, it's, it looks like a simple kind of a tool, but it's really, really valuable. And that is, uh, so the, the group of, uh, that is developing CCDVX calls it uh, um, the computational weather. And that's uh, because other things on the supercomputer can influence the performance of your tool. So what we do here in these plots is, uh, each step which happens sequentially is given a different colored line and then we have MPI rank and time and so over here we can see lots of white space, lots of uninstrumented code. And that's actually because we don't instrument the MPI calls. And what we actually found is uh, there were, this one was uh, MPI communication bound due to an issue with uh, how we were serializing objects in MPI for Pi. Once we fixed that though, we found an I.O. contention. So these are these blocks here. These are entire nodes just waiting for the file system. And once we've identified that this had to do with a Python logger, uh, we, and, and, and we uh, and started using the burst buffer, everything was good. The other thing that to keep in mind is um, these are workflows that are running on many different um, sites. And, and also for ECP, we, you know, we were at, at, Pearl, uh, at NERSC, we have Perlmutter, which is NVIDIA uh, GPUs, but for the Exascale machines, they are Intel and AMD. So we put um, uh, performance portability front and center. And so this is excellent work done by uh, one of our postdocs, uh, Felix. And so he took the uh, CUDA code that, that um, uh, the Exascale uh, team started with, and he ported it to, to Cocos. So the, the idea is, you're taking your, your CUDA loops or your, your, your CUDA kernel code and you're uh, expressing that as, par um, as um, uh, uh, um, kernel abstractions like parallel four for a parallel four loop. And then uh, you, you use a lambda to express the work for each individual item of your um, kernel abstraction. And that way, Cocos is able to have hardware independent kernel abstractions and use that to generate device-specific code. And that worked really well. Um, so uh, essentially up here we have a strong scaling plot, so number of nodes, same amount of work, and then just the wall time. So the original CUDA code is in blue here, and actually just going to Cocos, but staying on Perlmutter, we got a, a speed up. And then um, we were able to also take the same code and deploy it on, uh, and this is a, experiments on Crusher, but we are now working on deploying that on Frontier. You still get compiler issues, by the way, because Cocos generates the hip code for you. <laughs> and then if, if the compiler isn't ready, then you might still get that. And, and, and the reason, by the way, for this change here is because the kernel abstractions were able to more effectively use, well, the code that, that Cocos generated based on your kernel abstraction was more able to use the uh, GPU's resources and in our profiling showed it was actually register spilling that, was, uh, that the old code was suffering from. And you can really see that by looking at the multi-tenancy uh, um, performance of code. Uh, so here we are sharing the same GPU amongst uh, multiple MPI ranks. And the old code would, use, would actually benefit from having many different uh, ranks share the same GPU. And that's because there's a lot of latencies. Uh, whereas the new code it only needs to hide uh, I.O. And, and, and CPU latency. Uh, so two uh, separate MPI ranks can, can basically hand off work and alternate on the GPU. 
and then uh, because they are so effectively able to use that GPU. And this work is uh, being published um, in the uh, uh, um, Cray User Group's Proceedings Journal. All right. Finally, it's, it's not always smooth sailing. Uh, um, vendor um, libraries don't abstract away using Cocos. So if you use Kublas or QFFT and, and, and things like that, you still have to actually engage with vendors or the, the, the user community of other software packages to, to port their codes. And so here's an example of our uh, efforts. Um, we basically took a, a code that was um, not multi-GPU aware and we ported that uh, so we, we enabled, we ported that to AMD uh, and, and also we made it multi-GPU aware. And in these experiments you can see that you've got ideal weak scaling until you hit the max number of GPUs on that, uh, uh, on that node. So it's for core GPU and for summit. And then of course you, uh, you, you, you diverge. And whatever is happening here we don't really know, but anyway. And so then finally, um, I also want to point out it's not just uh, GPU optimization for XFL. Um, here's an example of bad load balancing. Remember each image, might, it, it not, wasn't immediately obvious what each image, how much work each image would be. So here's an example of a fork join pattern that is waiting for this rank to finish. So all of this blue here is MPI barrier waiting for just this one rank to finish. And as you scale that up to more ranks, this will get worse, right? Because you will have more and more waiters. And so Felix uh, did a great job at implementing a heuristic load balancing algorithm that took this to this. In fact, you can show it as a plot here. Um, so it's a, it's a simple heuristic that he found based on the number of active pixels in an image. And you can see that if we compare the just the orange, the, the, the total orange as a function of time for the two different load balancing strategies, you can see the dotted line is, is about 20% faster. And that really brings me to the end. Um, I'm just going to uh, briefly show the lessons learned. So the five Ps really. So we have got performance and portability. I think it's really important for folks to keep portability really high up on their list of priorities when writing code for GPUs. And kernel abstractions, are, if, if, you're able, if your algorithms are able to use them, it's a great way of achieving portability on a budget. <clears throat> we encourage everyone to measure everything. And there are instrumentation libraries like uh, Livermore's Gotcha uh, library. They can do that without inserting code into your, uh, um, you, you just inst you, it, it instruments the, the linker, it doesn't instrument your code. Um, uh, and then, of course, once you've measured everything, you have to uh, come up with a, a way of uh, looking at um, the data using a, a helpful dashboard. And, um, and of course, no porting effort is really for free. It's still a high-touch effort. Um, use a workflow manager, <laughs> basically. So when your workflow is planning its work, it's, it's really important that it has a place to store its uh, persistent state. We are using a CCTB, so, um, so CCTX is using a MySQL database. Um, others might use Mongo um, or just writing something to a file. Um, what really helped were collaborative accounts that we offer at NERSC where multiple users can become the same logical user and share data. Uh, you also saw Debbie's talk about uh, center, uh, data center APIs. And then finally, um, we want to also make sure that uh, we have a good way of packaging our workflows. If you're no longer a single monolithic compiled uh, binary, then you really have to think about how do I share dependencies in everything. Often we see uh, Anaconda being used in this field, but the problem is Anaconda can conflict with your operating systems libraries. That can be really nasty to debug. So we actually recommend um, using Shifter or Podman. So uh, in, in fact, Podman HPC, which is a, a, a project by NERSC, is uh, mounting system-specific libraries like a Cray, Ampage, and all the CUDA uh, drivers into the image. So that way, you are you're not no longer in conflict with your operating systems uh, image. Uh, you're, you're isolated from your operating system, but you are getting all the important libraries, and it has an added benefit. 
because it can, uh, all the data is bundled in one uh, compressed archive, it can be distributed to compute nodes before the job starts. So here's, an, here's a benchmark for Python. Um, when I get more and more MPI ranks in my MPI for Py job, my startup time diverges because Python needs to load a lot of, uh, needs to link against a lot of libraries and needs to read a lot of files. And if your file system doesn't, it can't keep up with the caching, it can diverge uh, the load time. Whereas containers are much, uh, um, ameliorate this effect uh, to a large degree by just shipping the code ahead of time. We already talked about um, uh, preemptible uh, queues. So that is work in progress. But I also I want to encourage people to explore more uh, flexible resource allocations like malleable jobs, so jobs that can grow and shrink. Uh, and finally, and I think this is really my last slide, yes, I want to also make sure, and I deliberately kept this as the last slide, don't forget about I.O. Workflows need to be held together by I.O. And here is an experience that we had with CCTBX in the early days. When, when the scratch file system is not happy, you can have a six times difference in the, in the performance of the scratch file system. And that can stop your data analysis and its tracks. So uh, I highly recommend look at uh, ways to optimize I.O., look at burst buffers. If you don't have a burst buffer, there is UnifyFS, which is another Livermore product that we're trying out, which produces in-memory burst buffers. Um, and of course, have something there to alert you that this is going on, because you don't want to be scratching your head uh, while the clock's ticking at your beam time. And with that, uh, I think I've come to the end. I'd like to thank you for your attention.